Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast. In this presentation, I want to address a question that I get asked fairly often. What are the main key principles of the ecological approach to skill? And this is something, of course, I tried to cover in my recent book, How We Learn to Move, uh, audio book, audio version coming soon. Um, they and in this, you know, I cover these in, in, in more detail, but what I wanted to try to do in this presentation is just highlight what I see as the key, key principles and how they connect and build on each other. So the key principles that I think are for the ecological approach to skill are performer environment symmetry, direct perception of affordances, information movement coupling, self-organization with respect to constraints, repetition without repetition, direct learning through experience, <clears throat> okay? Some people might claim that's a lot of terminology and very confusing, but let's go through each of these and show how they build on each other. So performance environment, performer environment symmetry. This is captured really nicely in the famous quote by William Mace, ask not what's inside your head, but what your head is inside of. What he meant by that is we need to consider as much the environment that we act in, our ecology, our niche, as we do what's going on up here in our marvelous brain, right? We tend to have this fixation on understanding what's going on inside the performer, right? And we tend to treat as skill as all being inside the performer without really considering the, where they're acting and what, what can, that can tell us about skill, right? So we spend a lot of time in sports training and we separating and pulling a performer out of their environment, right? We take a, a player out of the game and have them dribble around cones or hit off tees or run around tires. We have them look at things on computer screens instead of on a field. We have them touch things on a Dynavision board and so on. So we spend a lot of time taking a performer out of their environment in a very asymmetric approach, right? <clears throat> Creating an asymmetry between the performance and the environment because for a long time, we have believed that skill lies within the performer themselves. The environment is really not that important, right? The idea is that skill is something we acquire, we present, we possess. It's in the form of knowledge and terminal models, this incredible predictive or computational power in our brain, right? It lives within the individual. And for the most part, it can be understood out of context, right? <coughs> skill is about having good memory, attention good prediction abilities, right? Where exactly you do that is not that important, right? So these are the ideas that we kind of reject. That's what the big red X is before in, in the ecological approach, right? In the ecological approach, we believe that you cannot understand skill without under, including a really deep understanding of the environment because skill involves a developing an, a relationship, an adaptive relationship with a specific environment you're performing in, okay? So skill lives within the performance environment system, not within the performer, right? It's highly task specific, not general purpose. We don't develop general purpose models, memories, knowledge, attention, right? We develop very specific information from our environment that we use to control our actions, right? So that's the idea. We need to spend as much time understanding what's out there in the environment Will, what that will allow us to control the environment as we have been an understanding that the processing computation prediction that's going on in the brain. The reason, you know, that we think this, this view of this performer environment symmetry is the idea of direct perception, right? And this is the idea that comes from Gibson. The idea that, you know, if we spend as much time looking what your head's inside of, right, the environment, we'll see that there's rich, very bountiful information out there. In particular, if we look more carefully at how information from our senses, or if we focus on vision, how information from the environment is structured by the things out there, the events, the objects, the people out there, we would realize what Gibson pointed out is that there's information out there that directly specifies what we need to control our actions, right? Because of the way the light is structured by the environment, there's information we can pick up that tells us when a ball will be there, when it's where it's going to be, you know, how, how, whether we can pass or not, whether we should shoot directly from the environment because there's rich information out there without any need for computation, prediction, interpretation, enhancement from previous 
experience and so on, right? That's Gibson's fundamental idea of direct perception, right? <clears throat> and his idea, you know, it can be illustrated by this simple case, right? If we look at an expanding object, right? So an expanding object on your eye. So right here, we're creating an asymmetry, right? We're just focusing on what's happening in your on your eye without thinking about what's in the environment, right? So if we have expansion of a ball's image on your eye, the traditional approach to perception argues, oh, there's an ambiguity here, right? This could either be an approaching ball or an expanding ball, right? A ball that's coming at us or a ball that's in being inflated, right? Obviously, those have two different, afford two different opportunities for action, require different responses, right? So just by focusing on the ball's retinal image, just by focusing on the performer asymmetrically creates this ambiguity, right? Creates this problem that your brain then needs to solve. Right, it somehow needs to do some interpretation, bring in previous experience, maybe familiar size, you know, something to solve this problem, depth cues, whatever, right? Gibson argued, <laughs> this is nonsense, right? You're creating this am ambiguity because you're not looking at the whole environment. You're not looking for the in the environment for information that would actually tell you what you want, right? And so instead of looking at just the retinal image, Gibson pointed out that if you look at both the retinal image and the, the relationship between the object and the horizon. For example, if I look at the size of the ball and the angle between the object and the horizon, this creates an information source, this ratio between the angular size of the object and the angular distance from the horizon that tells you the different, that the removes the ambiguity, right? <clears throat> this ratio remains constant for an object that's approaching me while it does not remain constant for an object that expands, right? So. If we spend more time looking at what your head's inside of, right, the environment, we find this information that directly specifies what we need to act, right? And that's kind of one of the, the fundamental pieces of the ecological approach. Information is out there that we can use to control our actions without need for any processing enhancement, anything like that. Right? And this is one example. And from that, we get Gibson's related idea of affordance, right? Because this information is out there, it's available for our actions. He argued what we perceive is not the abstract physical properties of the world that we learn about in, in, in physics class, right? We don't see the world in terms of sizes, distances, speeds, etc. We perceive the world in terms of what it affords us, right? What it, opportunities it creates for action. So we, irregardless of what the environment is designed for or we, people have designed it for. And then my favorite example is a cat, right? A cat does not see stairs, coats, and sinks. It sees beds, right? It sees opportunities for laying down and sleeping everywhere in the environment, right? Because the information from the environment tells us there's, tells them there's a flat surface that they can be comfortable lying on, right? That's the idea of affordances, right? We directly per pick up opportunities for action, right? So these two pieces, point one, we need to look at how the performer relates to their environment, the symmetry. When we do so, we see that there's information there. This idea, this idea that information is imp impoverished and ambiguous and we, you know that perception is an illusion, all that idea comes from a, using an asymmetric view of the world. Right. As soon as we actually look at what, what our heads inside of, we realize that's not the case. <clears throat> so this leads to the third step. We've got this rich information, these affordances we can directly pick up that tell us what we need to know to act. Right. So we know how fast, how long before a ball is going to be there, for example, or how fast the gap between two offenders is closing. Now, how do we use that to control our movements? And this is the third key principle, information movement coupling, right? So imagine you, you have a football player that's running down the sideline towards the end zone. You are running to try to tackle them before they get there, right? So we have a bunch of, we have a bunch of variables here. We have their velocity, our velocity, the distance. How do I know whether I'm running fast enough to catch them, to intercept them, right? Um, do I need to speed up? Do I need to change my direction? Whatever. Right. The traditional view, again, is let's all focus inside the head. Right. And do some computation. Right. So what we're going to do is take in these variables, velocity, distance, and we're going to predict where the ball ca carrier will be at some future instance. Right. Where we have a predict incredible predictive brain. 
kind of like the problems you used to do in math class. Two trains are leaving the station, one at the 45 miles an hour, another 65, right? And from there, what you're going to do is take this prediction and program the movement, right? Program a movement to get you to the right spot at the right time, right? So controlling your movement in this way is, is involves this kind of modeling prediction going, you know, so it's, again, skill inside the head, right? You, you need your brain power to be able to do this, right? That's the basic fundamental idea of the traditional approach to skill. The alternative approach to skill that comes from, again, looking for in the environment, seeing that there's information there that is directly picked up is the idea we don't need to go to all this trouble. All we need to do is pick up one thing, the, what this angle between you and the runner, what's called the bearing angle beta. And all we need to do is run so that the change in bearing angle is zero, right? So we keep running. If we keep running and maintain this relationship, we were guaranteed to intercept, right? This is a, a strategy that animals use. It's a strategy people use for sailing ships, right? Um, this bearing angle strategy. All you have to do is, right, if the bearing angle starts to get too small, then you speed up. If it starts to get too big, then you slow down and you will be guaranteed to intercept that object, right? It's a simple information, bearing angle, movement, running speed, coupling, right? No need for complex computation, prediction, etc. right? So going back to points one and two, skill lives in a relationship, a relationship between information and movement right? Not inside the powerful processing of your head, right? So that's a fun, another fundamental idea of this, okay? So if we, this is how we control our actions, point four, how do we get there, right? How do we know what information to connect to what movement, you know, what, how to adjust, what types of things to adjust, this is another area where we fundamentally different ecological approach fundamentally differs. This is in terms of self-organization, right? So if we think of the way that we typically think of how our body is controlled, we think of it in a very top-down business manner, right? There's a boss, a central executive that issues all the commands for what the, the limbs are doing, right? So it's almost like a puppeteer. Your movements are co coordinated by this incredible brain you have that plans what all your elbow, shoulder, knee and do. Right. And this is basically Richard Smith's idea of the generalized motor program or motor schema. Right. I use the illustration of a marching band, like a marching band works this way. A choreographer tells all the march, all the people in the band what they're going to do when you turn, get to the 50 yard line, turn left. Right. So we have very linear top down control. Right. In the ecological approach, we do not think that it works this way. We, we argue that what happens is skill, this coordination pattern emerges through process of self-organization, right? That is <clears throat> the, the parts of the system, your joints, your muscles, um, you have local constraints. They have local rules they have to follow. And from this, this complex action emerges. And this is a quote I love from Gibson, behavior is regulate, regular without being regulated. And the classic example of this is, of course, the flock of birds, right? So a flock of birds flies in coordinated patterns without having a boss bird, right? They're only following local rules. I'm going to not hit my neighbor, right? If every bird does this, incredibly, they self-organize into this overall pattern of coordination. And importantly, right, <coughs> this self-organization self is determined by the constraints we face, right? Which is a, a key idea also in the ecological approach. Constraints of the individual, how big are the birds, the environment, whether there's wind, and what's their task? Are they trying to fly to a certain direction and so on, right? So that's the idea, the fundamental idea of, so go, we, we get this information from our environment, skill lives in the environment, perform a relationship. Um, we, we pick this information up, we control our actions by developing these law, control laws, these links between, and these develop and are, occur through a process of self-organization, right? The, the system working together, not us controlling every single aspect of our movement. Number five, right? So we've, we've developed this information control law, we've self-organized organized a key principle that comes from this, right? It, and the bringing in the idea of constraints is that in order to repeat 
uh, how we we consistently produce our outcomes, right? So we 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 figured out a way to achieve our goal: catch a ball, pass, shoot on goal, right? How do we keep doing that consistently, right? So basically, how if we want to achieve a consistent goal of hitting a ball, getting a ball through the hoop, how do we do that, right? How well, how does it relate to our movement of vari variability, and how do we best achieve that through practice of variability and coaching, right? And if we look at it, the traditional assumption is repetition through repetition, right? The way that we consistently get the ball in the hoop is by having consistent patterns of movement, right? So we have a repeatable shot, right? Wait, so repeatable shot technique, repeatable swing. So repeatable outcome of an action through repeatable movement. How do we achieve that? By having very, relatively low variability of practice, right? We want practice to be decomposed, shooting from the same location, having a coach tell you, nope, don't let your elbow drop, and so on, right? So the traditional assumption is that in order to keep producing our goal, right, we keep doing this same movement over and over. <clears throat> in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the ecological approach, we have a very different view. Because of those ideas of constraints, the self-organization constraints, the key point there is constraints are always changing, right? Um, we, our individual constraints change as we get fatigued, right? Our task constraints contain change, for example, in boss wells, more defenders come on us, right? We start getting making a few shots, now we get double teamed. Environmental conditions change from different co courts, different views in the back in the shot background when we're shooting, and so on. And multiple examples. For, because of this, and this is a, a fundamental idea that Nikolai Bernstein first proposed, right? Is that we're not we don't be skillful by repetition through repetition. We, we be skillful by repetition without repetition, right? In order to consistently achieve our outcome, we cannot do the same shot every time because the constraints are changing, right? We need different movement solutions to keep achieving the same movement goal. And Stephen Curry, if you watch, go watch a highlight of Stephen Curry. There's a great video on YouTube where it shows you know, he, he takes 50 shots in a row. They're all very essentially different, right? So he does not have one shot technique, right? He repeats his outcomes without repeating his movement, right? And the argument is that in terms of coaching is we achieve this by focusing on adaptability and practice, right? Having uh, a po opposition while you're shooting, shooting on the run, uh, fatiguing yourself by doing wind sprints before shooting, all these ideas, right? So a fundamental idea, once we become skillful, once we pick up that information directly, establish the information movement control law, we can't just stop there, right? It's not a, just a one size fits all solution. We need that solution to be adaptable to these changes and constraints. We need to repeat, if we wanna repeat our movement outcomes, we need to not repeat our movement solutions, right? So practice that, practice cons getting consistent outcomes requires a significant amount of movement variability, not the same movement over and over which is developed by adding a significant amount of variability to practice, okay? The last point, right? So we, we've got all these pieces together. We've, we've looked at our environment by being symmetrical, seeing there's information there that we can directly pick up to develop these information movement control laws, right? That allows us to self-organize and be successful under changing constraints by through repetition without repetition. Overall, how do we learn and keep developing as an athlete? This idea is, you know, the traditional idea is this is again happens in the head, right? It happens inside the performer. Getting better is all through important. We store memories, we develop internal models, we create memories of, of particular situations that are typical that we can recognize things and we become these better predictors, right? Again, a very asymmetric view of a skill going back to the, the first point, right? The skill is all in the head. It's all in the supercomputer in your brain. In the ecological approach, we argue that with experience, three essential things happen. And this all relates back to the first four thing, the first five points we I made here. The first thing that happens as you practice and keep experiencing situations that can happen is we can change the, the action variable that we decide to control, right? So when I move, right, if I want to hit, for example, if I want to hit a golf putt further, right? So say I put, I'm putting five feet and then I move 10 feet away. I need to hit the ball further. There's a lot of different ways I could do that, right? 
I could move my club fast, move my club head faster. I could do a longer swing, so it, a greater amplitude swing. I could just accelerate the acceleration, so on. I could use a totally different swing, where I, you know, like a, a drive, right? So, not only is there different information in the environment, there's different movement parameters that I could control to achieve my goal. And what we found, this is uh, Daphne Delay was the first one to show this, and we've kind of built on this in some of the research I've done is that elite golfers, what they do is uh, novice golfers tend to control the distance through controlling velocity, right? They do short, faster swings to putt further, whereas more skilled golfers use more amplitude, right? They use longer swing to hit the ball further. <clears throat> and we call this, I call this a education of intention, right? We're not storing knowledge, building memory. We're changing that information movement control law we talked about in point three. We're changing what the movement parameter we're controlling is, right? Whether it's speed, amplitude, duration, and so on. The second thing that can happen, we can, of course, change the information that we use, right? So, for example, a common example I see in baseball batting that I've studied is people, when they're first starting out, will time their swing based on the size of the ball. Right. When it gets to be a certain size on your eye, you can start swinging. Right. That, of course, will not work. Right. As soon as I start varying the speed of the pitch a lot. Right. This is something batters typically develop because they're, they practice off a batting machine, pitching machine that's throwing the same speed or a coach that throws roughly the same speed. It's not going to work very well if you if you, the speed is varying. What you really want to use to time your speed in your information movement control law is tau, which is the ratio of the size to the rate of change of size, which tells you when the ball is going to get there, no matter how fast it's going. So the idea is that another thing that can happen in this information movement control law through experience is educate what's called education of attention, changing to using a different information source. The final thing that happens with experience in the ecological approach is calibration, right? So we have this information movement control law, right? We need to understand, we need to obviously have a, something that links it together, right? A great example of this is control, stopping your car, right? So you know that pressing your on down on your brake, putting force on your brake pedal stops the car at a certain rate, right? Makes it slow down nicely to that stop sign. If you've ever rented a car or so, tried someone else's car, you often find that the brake force, the brake pedal is kind of different. It might be spongier, might be tighter. Um, you're still using the same information control law to, to perform your skill. You're still using the force in your foot to slow down. But now the, the, the link between the information, which is a tau-based information, and how your force of your foot has changed, right? In order to slow down at that same comfortable rate, you either have to push harder or softer. We call that an ecological approach, a change in calibration, right? So again, through these three simple things, changing what movement parameter you control, can changing what information you use to control it, and changing the relationship between the two, calibration, we can get all this wonderful uh, skill development through experience. We can learn through experience and what we, my, Jacobs and Michael have called direct learning, right? So those are, as I said, what I would consider to be the, the key principles of the ecological approach. I think they all kind of extend nicely from each other. Um, and, and why do I kind of push this approach? What do I think of the advantages? There's a couple, there's lots of them. Two of the main ones for me as a, as a person that does both research and as a, a coaching, a, a coach education and works with athletes. The first thing I like about the ecological approach is the ecological approach works in observables, right? So you could see what I was talking about, information, tau, gaps, you know, optic flow, right? Those are all things I can measure in the environment. I can measure the size of an object at time one. I can measure it at some time later. I can calculate its rate of angular size on your eye based on its distance, da 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 da, da right? So all in the information we're talking about and Gibson talked about are things I can go out in the world and measure. If I do, as May said at the start, consider what my head's inside of, right? I can also measure my movements. I can also, I can measure the feet of that golf club in the putter. I can measure the, the stroke length, the amplitude. I can measure the acceleration, right? So information control laws live in measurables, right? Um, they're not referring to some unobservable model, internal model or generalized motor program in my head that I have no access to. So that's one point. 
The second thing that I think is a real distinct advantage is the ecological approach actually solves the problem of motor control, right? That it do, it doesn't, um, you know, just this, whereas I think that in many traditional approaches, they're just displacing it, right? So information control law for hitting links the movement of my bat to tau or some other source of information. So it tells exactly what I'm controlling, when and how. Whereas saying the batter predicts that's a fastball, all I've done is moved an event in the outside world, uh, the pitch is a fastball, to uh, the event inside your head. You predicted it's a fastball. What do you do with that prediction, right? So what exactly do I do with that prediction about where that football player was running in my example, right? Do I use it in a motor program? You know, this is where, in, where in, and I did a lot of work in this area and it really kind of fell down for me. I don't think it has as much power. What are the evidence for benefits of training following ecological principles? Well, if you go to this, this website, I've created perceptionaction.com slash comparative. I've listed, I keep a running tally of studies that have made direct comparisons between methods which promote these kind of things we've been talking about, direct perception, self-organization, direct learning. And I've kept Italian, and there's a quite a number of studies now that have shown positive benefits for using this kind of approach, including a couple I've done on baseball. So if you're interested in more details, you can go there. Okay, that's it for this presentation on the key principles of the ecological approach. Um, you can find more information about me at perceptionaction.com. Calm. And of course, if you want more details, uh, you know, I tried to follow the same kind of approach in the book where I start with these principles and try to link them all together. So if you're more interested in kind of more detail, more description of those studies I mentioned, uh, please check out my book, How We Learn to Move. Thank you.